Hi. <coughs> it's July 31st. I'm Elisa Barwick, standing in for my husband, Robert Barwick, who's down with the virus. How are you, Craig? Oh, well, I'm getting better, thanks, Elisa. But, but welcome to your first uh, CEC report. Yep, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Um, in this week's CEC report, we're going to cover, firstly, America follows the POMs down Glass-Steagall pathway. Secondly, transatlantic war faction pushes back. And finally, when will Australia wake up? More jobs down the gurgler. So Craig, at the beginning of this month, we saw a flurry of activity coming out of London with top British bankers and establishment figures calling for Glass-Steagall. Yeah, look, I think it's really important for our listeners to get a grip on what this means because you know, we've been talking on this show for a long time about Glass-Steagall reforms. Now, what the Glass-Steagall is, is a return to the 1933 banking reforms initiated by Franklin Roosevelt to bring the commercial investment banks back into line at that point. What he did was he said, we're going to cut the speculation and separate out the legitimate commercial banking from the investment banking. Now, today we have $1.4 quadrillion of speculative debts in the system. There's something like $128 trillion just in Australia alone. So what the call is, is that there has to be a return to separating out the legitimate banking system the commercial banking system that we need for real commerce from the speculative side, which is your investment and merchant banking. So when we're talking about a return to Glass-Steagall, particularly by the upper echelons of the British financial establishment, mm. we're talking about a complete revolution of the system. We're talking about going back to a banking system that works. In fact, we're talking about a bankruptcy reorganisation mm. in order to get rid of the, the disastrous amount of speculative debt mm. in the system. So any single bank would either have to trade in uh, derivatives and investments. Okay, that's fine, they can do that. However, if they want to take deposits and be a commercial banking enterprise, they can't participate in the other. So they're one or the other. That's right, and it's, it's, it's a distinguishment based upon what the banks actually do. Mm. And it's got nothing to do with how the banks are now. If they've got aspects of them that are involved in commercial, that's protected. The complete speculative activity is pushed aside and the government, you know, is not concerned about that. Mm. Now this is exactly, this separation is exactly what a leading American figure has now followed this uh, British move in calling for, and that is the former CEO of Citigroup, oh, Sandy Wheels. Yeah. It's been covered in the Sydney Morning Herald, the Financial Review down here. So this is not lost on the Australian financial community about what this actually means. Mm. And just so our viewers know, this is of such a huge moment because Sandy Wills is one of the was one of the leading lobbyists who actually brought about the repeal of Glass-Steagall. In fact, in 1988, Greenspan granted a waiver to Travelers Insurance Company, which was then handed by Wills, so that they could buy Citibank. Travelers also owned Salomon Smith Barney, a large investment bank. Now that Travelers Citibank merger for the first time since the passage of the Glass-Steagall Act in 1933 allowed a single bank holding company to own a commercial bank, an insurance company and an investment bank. So the fact that this fellow is now calling for a return to Glass-Steagall and he's saying he was wrong about you know, repealing it, this move has been cited in high level political circles in America as a massive step toward a new Glass-Steagall law and an end of the marginalisation of what is widely known to be Lyndon LaRouche's proposal. Yeah, I think Lynn made it very clear in the last couple of days is that the British financial oligarchy at the top of the British financial monetary system decided that they were not going to survive under the current monetary system. And they said, we have to have a Glass-Steagall. Lord Miners, Peter Hambrose from Hambrose Banking came out, the Financial Times came out saying that we needed a Glass-Steagall. What LaRouche is saying is that this is an institutionalised response now from the United States because of the financial oligarchy in the US, that the US is responding in this way to, it's not just a personality coming out and supporting, but this is a policy shift, a transatlantic policy shift towards the Glass-Steagall and those, look, this has created an enormous stink. I mean, they're talking, is the, the banking community saying, you can't unscramble the eggs, right? You can't put the tooth back, toothpaste back in the tube. I mean, you can't undo what's already been done. Rubbish. Look, the problem is that with the, the, the Frank Dodd bill, 
the whole, you know, the, um, the Volcker rules, all these things do not look at what the type, what the system is that we have in place, which is a monetarist speculative system. It's where money itself is given a value. Money is an idiot. It should never be given a value and it should be controlled very tightly by sovereign national governments. So what the Glass-Steagall does, it says we're not going to have this speculative value for money anymore. We are going to re-regulate the entire monetary system. We're not going to give money an implicit value. We're going to make sure it comes under the control of nation states. And look, there's a lot of countries around the world that would jump at the opportunity of re-regulating their currencies. Take, for example, what's taking place in Europe right now. You've got a massive move away from the euro. Um, Spain, Greece, these countries are going to most probably dump the euro in the next couple of months because the fact is that their economies are being destroyed by the whole uh, Maastricht process, which is what it was designed to do and which is what LaRouche has always said it was designed to do. What we have here with the, the euro, what we have with the glass, the taking down of the Glass-Steagall was a destruction of the concept of the sovereign nation state, the idea that nation states govern their own internal financing through credit creation. And again, Mr. LaRouche on his website, larouchepack.com, uh, has been talking about the wh what is a credit system. Well, a credit system is basically the investment in the future, where a sovereign government says, we intend to do this. So a credit system funds a future intention. So if we decided we wanted to build the Bradfield Scheme or you know, extend the Stony Mountain Scheme or build the Clarence River Scheme or the uh, high-speed ring rail proposal, that intention would be funded by credit. At the end of the day, that intention becomes a reality of physical infrastructure that then grows the physical economy. Money has nothing to do with it. Mm. Money is simply a means of exchange. And if you could use bits of coin, you could use pieces of special bark, pieces of wood carved out a bit, a bit, hard, bit, uh, bit hard to manage, but the point is that money, money itself, if, if you give money a value itself, then you get a system we have now of British monetarism and that can be manipulated and you see the sovereignty of nations literally destroyed. So really Glass-Steagall is just the bare minimum baseline and we need to be very rapidly moving beyond that to establish a credit system and follow up works massive infrastructure and works projects. There's a survival uh, fight going on. People don't want to see themselves destroyed and that's what's going on here. So you know, we have to keep pushing in this country for a Glass-Steagall um, and you know, that is the only way out of this current mess in the global financial system. Mm. Well, there's certainly a big stink about it. We, um, some of us here watched a video yesterday where Barney Frank, um, the representative responsible for Dodd-Frank and both Senator Dodd and Representative Frank were very freaked out by this proposal of Glass-Steagall because it's now coming to the top. It's top echelons in a transatlantic community that are going with this now across both Britain and the United States. And uh, Frank in particular was uh, in a TV interview really um, just cutting off the reporter and very dismissive of any uh, sense of even discussing this subject. This is a taboo subject. Everyone knows that LaRouche is behind this. So quite clearly um, there is a major sensitivity that the real issues are on the table. We are at crunch point in this crisis, in this global financial meltdown, and we don't have a lot of time to waste. So no, hopefully definitely. we'll see this followed up by very uh, quick moves to replace Obama Mitt Romney, I mean, really, LaRouche has been saying that there's no, neither of these guys could be a successful president, oh, could they? Absolutely no, because, I mean, Romney's still supporting the, the, um, the, uh, the, the, the Dodd-Frank plan. I mean, this guy is, uh, is a complete loser in terms of foreign policy. There's no solutions. In fact, I heard reports in the Australian press that they're following the, uh, they're following the same standards that we have down here of the, uh, the high rates of disapproval. You know, twenty-eight percent for the Gillard government. It's the same, you know, for Obama. Same with Mitt Romney. It's what's characteristic is their disapproval rate, not their approval mm. rate. And speaking of the Australian politicians, we know for a fact that Wayne Swan, our treasurer, has been appraised of these developments uh, when this first broke in Britain at the beginning of the month. Jan Pacallis, our Queensland State Secretary, was able to meet with Swan at a community cabinet meeting in Red Bank in Queensland and she personally and in some depth filled him in on these developments which he admitted he was aware of. So 
when do you think these guys are going to get with the program? We've got other countries beginning to move with the reality. There's at least some discussion now beginning in the Australian media. Well, that comes back to the people. It comes back to the people watching this show, getting on the blower, calling up meetings for the, their MPs, their local councillors, getting our newspapers to them, saying, look, cut the garbage, will you? We've been talking about this. The CEC's been talking about this. We've put the resolution up before on this program. The resolution talks about Glass-Steagall as a second point. You know, it's, it's stunning, in fact, how the CEC has been so much on the mark on what we've been talking about over the years, but it requires the population to get a little bit smarter and say, and actually get off their hindquarters and act. Mm -hmm. And it's the same in the US, it's the same in every country. And you do see, you look at the actions that's taking place in Greece and places like that, well, we don't want to see the same sort of violence levels as Greece, but mm. we do want that sort of activity in Australia. Mm, that's mm. right. Okay, well, we're going to take up how the British war faction are pushing back after this break. Welcome back. Now we're going to discuss transatlantic war faction pushes back. So, given the seriousness of the global financial crisis that we're facing and the fact that leading figures now across the transatlantic are taking LaRouche's side of the battle on Glass-Steagall. Obviously there's going to be a major reaction from within the hardcore elements in Britain itself, within the oligarchy. Now Lyndon LaRouche's wife, Helga Zepp LaRouche, put it this way several days ago. She said that this faction would rather risk a military catastrophe than accept the rise of the Asian countries while the transatlantic region goes down. So they will blow up the world if they have to, so that they can stay on top of the rubbish heap no matter how bad it gets. Which, which is what we've been talking about in our latest New Citizen, about the build-up of military assets in the Pacific to try and contain China, which I think our readers or our, watchers, our listeners should really get a copy of that from our website and really understand that this is not some abstract uh, so some abstract issue on some remote part of the world, but Australia is implicitly involved in fermenting potentially the next thermonuclear World War Three. Mm. Is this why, Craig, uh, we've had a host of leading figures, including the Depu former Deputy Secretary of State from the United States, Richard Armitage, complaining that Australia is cutting its defences and riding on the coattails of the US at a time when we should be yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of economic barriers here as well because, I mean, the problem is that Australia's economy internally is collapsing mm -hmm. and, you know, somehow you're supposed to increase defence spending and then the enormous amount of defence spending they're talking about we can't actually do economically, but that doesn't mean it's not going to get done because mm. the intention at the end of the day is that if Australia's called to build up its, its weaponry to take on China in a con military confrontation, then that's what Australia will do because that's what we've always done. It's not a good policy, and there's a big split in the military fact, uh, military int uh, intelligence um, uh, um, community here in Australia about the way that Australia pr should proceed in defence strategy. But our paper gets to the core of the issue in that we're actually participating now in the build-up to, mm. in a sense, contain China, as sort of was elaborated in the 2009 white paper on defence, which is a very, very dangerous policy for us. Mm. And it's this push for a confrontation with Syria to have regime change there mm. in the same way as what was done in Libya that would uh, get such a war going with Russia and with China. Now just in the last week the US and the French and Germans pushed a new UN security resolution uh, which threatened the Syrian government under Chapter 7 which permits both economic sanctions and military force. Now that again was vetoed by Russia and China, showing exactly the level of tension here. But the US then tried to whip up a frenzy along the lines of the Tony Blair dodgy dossier about Iraqi weapons of mass destruction which was used to launch the war in 2003. This time about, as we all heard on the news, Syrian chemical weapons. Now <coughs> since that uh, UN resolution was vetoed, the US has made it clear nonetheless that they will bypass the UN Security Council altogether and directly escalate the war drive to overthrow the Assad government by giving open support, as they already have been doing, to the Syrian opposition, as again, as they did in Libya. Now, also on July the 20th, the British Foreign Secretary, William Hague, told BBC Radio 
that we will all be doing more outside the Security Council and intensify our work to support the Syrian opposition to give humanitarian aid outside the work of the Security Council. There are several things we can do. First of all, to give more practical support to the Syrian opposition. And he did go on to say we do not give lethal support. Humanitarian support? You've got to be kidding. That is just a straight, blatant mm. lie. Mm. Look, they've... What we've discovered in the last day or so, Elisa, is that the funding for this comes from the same apparatus as the funding for 9-11. This is the funding is coming from the Saudis. It's coming through British conduits and uh, American complicity. You're talking hundreds of millions of dollars here of funding for weapons. Now, how do we know this? Well, look, the fact is in the last uh, you know, couple of days, there's a Washington-based organisation called the Syrian Support Group. Now, they openly advocate uh, arming the Free Syrian, Syrian Army. And it was announced this week that the Treasury's Department Office on a Foreign Assets Control has granted it a waiver to provide logistical and financial support for the armed resistance. Now, the OA, uh, OFAC decision is huge, Brian Sayers said from this particular group. He says it gets us uh, the leeway to support the Free Syrian Army in broad terms. Those terms include providing financial, communications, logistical support to the FSA, which can be used to pay for salaries, provisions, communications, equipment, satellite imageries and vehicles for transport. They don't ever talk about what that also means. Support for weaponry, you know, the use of uh, the call for the use of drones by the US Army, Look, this is a private uh, organisation being co-opted by the, the government of the, United, of the United States in order to say, we don't support this formally, but they're using private channels in order to foment the war, which is exactly the intention of what the British Foreign Minister Haig wants. They want a war against Russia and China, as Helga said, if they can't have their way in the global financial system. Mm. They're like they don't, uh, if they see a glass steel coming down, then they'll foment a war first and foremost. Mm. And these opposition groups in Syria on the ground are intimately connected with Al-Qaeda and are yes. known to be so. Al-Qaeda has declared jihad to go in and overthrow the Assad government uh, some time ago. They've been known to behind, be behind some of these bombings. And, uh, you know, so why is the United States openly supporting al-Qaeda, literally, and uh, helping them to overthrow the Assad government when these were the people behind 9-11, which well, killed so many Americans. Well, this shows you how desperate the, the British are that they're using their puppets in America, like Obama, to try and get a war going. I mean, B Obama is a very uh, is a mental case, a narcissistic personality, as we've said on this show, as people can get more information uh, on our website. Mm. And there's a very good video, I believe, called Syria on the OPAP website, which people we should uh, uh, direct people to. Yes, very, very good. So we'll leave it there and return shortly. Welcome back. When will Australia wake up? More jobs down the gurgler. So Craig, there has been yet another round of job losses. These large job losses and shutdowns, which were once the odd occurrence, you know, you'd have a major shutdown every month or a couple of months. Now they're becoming seemingly perpetual, a daily occurrence. What's going on? It's a shutdown of our physical economy, Elise. I mean, the fact is the monetary system is just destroying, destroying our capacity to uh, to maintain these jobs. I mean, we have a policy of free trade in this country, and that's literally, and globalisation and privatisation, it's literally destroying them. Uh, literally. I mean, look, this week uh, we've seen the, uh, the shutdown of the Kernel uh, petrol refinery in New South Wales, 640 jobs. Now, this is a tragedy. This is a, not just a tragedy, but it's a national security issue. Here we are, a nation, an island nation state, Right, it's saying we don't need to refine our own oil. We, we'll get it from Asia uh, when we can. At the moment, that's fine. But what happens if there's some sort of a problem, like we've been talking about with China, mm. right? It, it may not be any cause of our own, but the problem is how do we get enough refining capacity to, uh, to pr pr produce the necessary petrochemical product products, uh, products for us? Then you're looking at, for example, another 164 
maintenance jobs going from Qantas at LTQ, the airline uh, engine man maintenance facilities being shut down. These are high-tech jobs literally being lost. But the real scary one is what we've been talking about a lot on this show, is the shutdown of, of our machine tool sector, and that's the car manufacturing sector. Now, it's come to light that Ford, for example, has not made any plans for the production of any more Fords or motor vehicles, no new models, for the year 2016 onwards. Now, that indicates that they're looking at where, whether, they're actually seriously looking at whether they, they're going to actually continue production here in Australia. Well, th there's a problem. If Australia's reduced its tariffs on the car industry to the point that it's no longer uh, cheaper to produce the cars here in Australia than to use their huge production plants in Southeast Asia and simply ship the cars in, why would they keep plants open here in Australia? And this is the problem. Now, we've put a resolution out on the back of our last New Citizen, which we've been circulating, and we've been doing a lot of coverage on a weekly basis on the Australian Alert Service, of which you're the editor. And that's our resolution, the uh, develop or die resolution. And that resolution goes through three crucial aspects. First of all, we've got to get rid of the policies that were initiated by Paul Keating and Bob Hawke in 1983. Get rid of the idea of privatisation, free trade, globalisation. Dump them. These are the policies that we're seeing reflected in all these job losses. Secondly, we have to uh, uh, go with a Glass-Steagall, a, a Glass-Steagall monetary organisation, a bankruptcy reorganisation, which is what we call for as well. But a Glass-Steagall by itself is not good enough. You have to have a, uh, a motivator behind having a Glass-Steagall, which means you have to have a large-scale infrastructure developments funded by public credit, which again in our last New Citizen we wrote a lot about. Now, what do we mean? It means that we have to be able to have a national banking system here in Australia, a highly regulated banking system around a national bank, like the old Commonwealth National Bank, where we em emit credit for the future development of our nation, like that's water projects, rail projects, like I was talking about before. Now, we've gone out and we've started to recruit members of parliament, local councillors uh, around Australia, which we do feature in the Australian Alert Service as, as often as we can every week. And the intention here is that we have to stop this destruction of Australia or we will die. Mm. So tell our viewers, Craig, what can they personally do uh, using this resolution? Should they? We're trying to reach every council in Australia, organise individual councillors, um, first response, emergency workers, people that under crisis conditions are going to need to take action immediately and they're not going to have time to think about it at that point. So. Can people uh, well, get involved in this? Yes, they can, can. They can get copies of our paper um, and then literally take the paper to their local MP. doesn't matter how many copies of the local MP gets. The point is you need to have uh, a mobilisation, a people power mobilisation on this to say, look, we've had enough. Mm. And the problem is politicians only listen to people power. Mm. I mean, a lot of them are pretty gutless, Elisa. Mm. Uh, a lot of them agree with us behind closed doors. But when they go public, oh, no, you can't do that because you've got to be realistic. Well, realistic is 164 jobs here, 640 there, the entire car manufacturing uh, industry being shut down. That's reality. These, other, these politicians live in ivory towers. Yeah, look, it's getting down to the wire. If you haven't been to our website, if you haven't joined us as a member, now's the time to do so. You can download the resolution. You can download the new citizen. Give us a call. Get involved. That's all we have time for this week. Thanks very much, Craig. You're welcome, Melissa. I hope to see you again sometime. Yeah, join us again next week. And thanks for tuning in.